Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Water Talk. Great to see you all here today. Before I introduce the speaker for the talk, I just want to acknowledge that we participate on traditional territories of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people, um, and remind you of the fact that our campus here is situated on the Haldeman Tract, land that was granted to the Six Nations, including six miles on each side of the Grand River. And our work in the Water Institute, University of Waterloo more generally, is um, taking place across our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building, and centralized in the Office of Indigenous Relations. Um, we're very happy to have a al alum uh, here with us today, uh, Professor uh, Pet Chow Fraser. Uh, she did her undergrad and her master's degree here at the University of Waterloo in the Department of of, um, of biology, and then she went on to become the professor in a professor in the Department of Biology at McMaster University, where she's now, where she teaches courses in applied ecology, environmental sustainability, and management of aquatic ecosystems. She worked with her student on research uh, on conservation restoration of aquatic ecosystems, primarily in the coastal zone of the Great Lakes, using trophic level manipulations, remote sensing, GIS techniques, radio telemetry, and environmental DNA. Another goal of Dr. Uh, Chow Fraser's research program is to increase the capacity for citizen science and to fully engage and empower youth in First Nations. Since 2013, she has co-created research with various First Nations to conduct research on drinking water quality, water security, monitoring ecosystem health in indigenous communities throughout the Great Lakes region. In 2023, her work was honored with the prestigious Lifetime Achievement Award by the International Association for the Great Lakes Research, recognizing her pioneering work uh, in understanding wetlands ecology across the Great Lakes and inspiring students and serving as a role model for women in science. We're very honored to have Pat here with us today. Please welcome her to the floor. Thank you. Okay, I hope this is the one that I'm using. Uh, well, thank you very much for that uh, great inv introduction and for the invitation to come here. Um, it's always a pleasure to be back um, on home territory, although I think there's only a very small part of that remaining of the, of the campus that I, that I knew and loved. Um, so I don't know if you've ever had the experience where you walk into a room and you think, oh, I've been here before. And then people tell you, no, you've never been here before. In fact, you've never been in this country. Um, and so I had this sort of thing happening to me when I was looking over data, when I was, um, you know, these gray hairs are not lying. I am close to my retirement, and I'm thinking of all the, the work that I've been doing and then trying to pull together a story and I realized that, you know, I thought it was deja vu, but it's actually maybe jamais vu. So that's the, 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 um, the setup for this talk. And then at the end of my talk, I hope you'll have a chance to, to uh, vote on that, whether it's, it's one or the other. Um, I want to give my own acknowledgement because I think it's re really important for everyone to, to make a step in this. Um, we know that uh, McMaster also stands in the land that's protected by the dish with one spoon wampum agreement. Um, and the wetlands that we sample in Georgia Bay are also within the Anishinaabeg territory. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that for thousands of years, that people before us have done science and that they've had their own knowledge base. And they're offering assistance to Europeans when we first came here. Um, well, I'm not European, but Europeans preceded me. Um, and I seek a new relationship with the original peoples of the land and give honor and thanks to the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe nations as the traditional inhabitants of the lands where I work, live, and conduct research. Okay, so I'm sure that this audience is probably well aware of the Great Lakes. Um, and you may not know that there are 17,000 kilometers of shoreline, and around here is where we have these Great Lakes coastal wetlands. And the, these coastal wetlands occur, by definition, within two kilometers of the shoreline. 
and they are 216,000 hectares of coastal wetlands um, in the Great Lakes, plus or minus 100,000 maybe. Um, and uh, many of you probably should know that there are binational Great Lakes, including Superior, Huron, Erie, and Ontario, and that there is one U.S. lake, Michigan. And I, pro I proffer that there is a sixth Great Lake, and that's Georgian Bay, which is solely within Canada. And it is only slightly less in, in surface area than Ontario. So it really is one of these hidden gems that uh, I've had the pleasure to conduct research in. Most of the coastal wetlands in Georgia Bay right now are still very, very ecologically excellent condition. And they have high biodiversity and they provide critical habitat for a lot of species. But they're also economically important. And all Great Lakes coastal wetlands are nature-based solutions for climate change. And the Ontario nature calls them shock absorbers, which, because the flood damage in urban areas can be reduced by up to 38% by their very presence. Now, one thing that you have to recognize is that hydrologically, Lakes Michigan and Huron and then um, by implication, Georgian Bay, which is part of Lake Huron, are all hydrologically connected. Um, and so we just look at the water levels for Michigan Huron, um, as opposed to all of the other three lakes separately. Um, and the other thing to note is that the water levels of Lakes Huron and Michigan, as the result of whatever water is is released from Lake Superior or that are um, somehow held back because of the St. Clair River flowing through. If it's, if it's filled up, um, it would flow down a lot less. And inherent in the Great Lakes are these fluctuations in water levels. So water levels fluctuate naturally on a daily basis, on a seasonal and an annual basis. And within Ontario, and this is the Ontario, um, Ontario Wetland um, Evaluation System, recognizes that the lower boundary of the Great Lakes coastal wetlands is two meters. This is just, um, for me anyway, and as I will try and, and, and convince you, is quite an arbitrary designation for the, for the bottom, con uh, for, the, for the lower boundary. Um, and also, in order for it to be recognized and assessed, it has to be at least two hectares large. And you can see from the rest of my talk that this is also a really big impediment when it comes to Georgian Bay. So like all of the other Great Lakes coastal wetlands, um, the, the threats include urbanization and agricultural development. Um, you can see here that when, when we finally did an inventory of all of the Great Lakes coastal wetlands that we discovered that only a very few remain from the time of the European settlement. Um, there are also a lot of wetlands that have been removed on Lake Erie in the western end for, um, that, that used to be um, wetlands that are now farms. And of the remaining wetlands, there's a lot of degradation from the activities of these humans that live around there. So it includes runoff in, with, that contains sediment, contaminants, and so on, as well as the problems with fragmentation um, and, and encroachment onto the, these coastal wetlands. There's also problems with invasive species. I, I did a lot of work on Coots Paradise of the problem with common carp because they stir up the water through their feeding and their spawning behaviors. And we know that when, in, when turbidity increases, um, so the light penetration decreases and that has impact on the submergent vegetation. 
There's also in, in invasive Phragmites, which is a species that has arrived in the Great Lakes Basin around the end of the 1990s. And that has posed a lot of problems for wildlife that live in there. Um, and it's also e economically an important um, consideration because they can also off obstruct vision in traffic. So, and it costs a lot of money to remove them, uh, as well as they, they tear up the infrastructure, the roads. So water level disturbances is also one of the things that I'm gonna focus on that is a threat. Now, it, it, you, it might seem like this is, um, this is uh, not possible because I told you that the Great Lakes water levels fluctuate naturally. And in fact, it's these disturbances, these daily and annual fluctuations that keep high biodiversity in these wetlands. Um, and in order to understand how that works, we need to recognize the different types of, of vegetation. So that includes the meadow species that occupy the, the, the uh, seasonally wet areas of the wetland. Then there's also the emergent vegetation that can tolerate some degree of inundation depending on the species. Then there are also floating and submergent aquatic vegetation, which I will just refer to as SAV. They have to be in water in order to survive. And so you can see that with water levels fluctuating, then it's going to benefit one of these classes during the time, depending on what the water levels are. So here's a generalized uh, vegetation zonation diagram. So we have the Great Lakes water levels. Um, the, wherever there is the boundary, then up, upstream of that, of that shoreline is terrestrial, and then everything below that is aquatic. And in Ontario, we would recognize it only down to the two meters depth. Then there are trees, there are um, the metal species like sweet gale and sedges, which are very common, um, emergent species like cattails, and then further down in the water that can tolerate the water inundation of bulrush. And then we have water lilies and other floating, and then pondweed and milfoil. And so the, the cyclical low water levels will benefit the terrestrial vegetation because they will, they will um, migrate down, whereas when it becomes high water levels again, the submergent and the floating would benefit. And so it's these um, regular cycles of water level fluctuations that keep it in a very, very um, good environment with all kinds of vegetation. Now there are other things about coastal wetlands that you need to recognize that, um, that are the, the types, the geomorphic type. Now there are subclasses within the riverine, but for now we'll just refer to all of these as riverine. So basically there's a river that flows through and there's sedimentation around the sides and then eventually the marsh um, is formed. There are also barrier protected wetlands. So these are, there's a barrier beach that breaches. Now this is a permanent breach because uh, a shipping channel has been created. Um, and then there are also um, those that, that don't have, but they just breach naturally from high waters. Now these wetlands, these lacustrine wetlands, don't have the same boundaries. It's not very obvious where, uh, whereas these ones have a, a strict boundary, these ones don't because there's a lakeward end of them. Now I'm going to show you a video that's going to be off the uh, Georgian Bay. And I want you to see that there are obviously some rocks here. There are, there's a, uh, the, the forest edge. 
Um, and I, I think it may be a little bit difficult for you to see because the light isn't uh, down enough, but you can actually see right down to the bottom of this, and you can see submergent vegetation all the way down below here, and there's some floating up above. This is a typical Georgian Bay coastal wetland. And this is a lacustrine wetland. I hope you'll agree that you don't see invasive phragmites there. You don't see any sign of human activities, okay? There's no city or farm beside it. Um, just believe me, there's good water penetration or light penetration in the water. Uh, and in this particular case, down to four or five meters in depth. Um, but there is another zone which was not identified in the previous generalized and which has not yet been described. Does anybody see what I may be referring to? Maybe this might, this photo of another coastal wetland in Georgian Bay, do you see what I'm talking about? You, you are very shy. Okay, do you see these dead trees? I don't know any other biological term to describe them or ecological term, they're just dead trees. Well, this is a novel vegetation zone. Um, and the cottagers that have lived there that I talk with, they have never seen them for the last 50 or 60 years that they've lived there. And so this kind of a zone is unprecedented. And I've been giving talks like this, and there's a certain gentleman whose name is Michael Waddington, and some of you might know him. He's a real skeptic. Now he's, you know, this is taped, so he's gonna probably watch it. But he'll, he'll say, is this really unprecedented, Pat, though? Like, okay, I mean, like, look at this graph, right? This is a water level graph of Lake Huron, Michigan, uh, so therefore Georgian Bay. And you can see ups and downs. Now, we're living in this period. So when I first noticed that things were happening, we were at this point, and we said, okay, we don't really know if that's really anomalous, but so then we go another 10 years, and then, we, okay, now this is really, really anomalous, right? Well, and this is only until 2006, I think, the data. So this is really just the early part. Uh, a study by Hanrahan et al. found that there are cycles of fluctuations that are eight years in duration, as well as 12 years in duration, as well as, I believe, um, there's, I think there's an, a larger one than that, 33 years. Um, and so I started thinking, okay, for people like Mike, how about if I took the long-term mean for the century, so from 19, from 1919 uh, until 1999, and then I extended it to the period of study that I'm interested in, and then I, I split them up into eight year intervals. And then I just simple thing, just determine for each year if it's above the long term mean or below the long term mean, okay? And then I just basically summarize them in this graph. So all the blue ones are above the mean and the red ones are below the mean. So during the period of study, which starts here, In the last two decades, it's the only time when we have two consecutive periods of eight years where there everything, 100% of those years, was below the long-term mean. Also, in no other time in the past did we ever see where 100% below becomes 100% above. So those conditions, I argue, are unprecedented. And it's actually the cause of some of these different zonations that we're seeing. So the hypothesis that I have, okay, so we go back to the original generalized scheme. And you see now water levels are down to here after the first 14 years. T 
terrestrial habitat has expanded, the aquatic is theoretically migrating down. Then you still have the trees, but the trees now are starting to colonize within the meadow because it's just not getting wet. The, the, it's, the metal species now are getting squeezed out because the trees are coming in, but also the emergent vegetation is also expanding, because it can, and they're much more aggressive. And they're also expanding down towards the shore. And then, meanwhile, we just hope and pray that the submergent vegetation are actually still migrating down. And of course, it's taken 14 years for this to happen, and so they, they definitely have migrated down to here. But the, the two meters water uh, depth is now much further out towards the lake, okay? Now, I, I mentioned here that there's an asterisk. It's aquatic if there is no sill. So in some of these wetlands, because they're underlain by rock by the Precambrian Shield, there's a, there's a hard uh, bottom to where they can, and they just don't erode. So therefore, if water levels go below that, the entire wetland gets dried. Uh, and the extent of the lakeward migration is going to depend on the bathymetry. So if you have a very steep slope, then it's not going to migrate as much as if it was very, very shallow. And then what happens in the, in the subsequent uh, eight years or so that follow th this inundation period, or uh, that follow this sustained low water period? So now the water levels have come back up to there, and now it's the turn for the aquatic to expand. The Great Lakes water depth now is at three meters, because it's a, a meter above. And what we have is the lilies and the pondweed marching up the slope. Um, again, this now, bull, bulrush can tolerate some of this, so they can be, they can remain, but a lot of the cattails and those kind of emergence die out. And then the thing about those trees that colonize and the shrubs, now they're inundated and so they can't survive anymore. So they become dead trees, all right? And it's only when you get this combination of really prolonged low water followed by a really rapid increase that you get this sort of pattern. But the question is, does this dead tree zone, which we've now coined and it's published, um, does it vary across wetlands? And in fact, how does aquatic vegetation change across these various periods, as well as the fish community? Now, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested in these is because throughout this entire period, there's still no cottages being built in there. There's still no roads and agriculture. So the human impact aspect of these wetlands remain the same, and yet these you know, are there real changes that we can see happening to these wetlands? And as an ecologist, I've developed quite a lot of ecological indicators that are based on the presence of certain species. And some of those indices are not reflecting changes in water level disturbances and tolerance. So do I, does that mean that I have to go back to my indices and recalculate them? Sadly, yes, and I'm going to show you. Okay, so we have this period now. The, 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 the beauty of this is that we have data for every single time period that we have here. Um, these, this is the work of Danny Montocchio, who is my current PhD student. Um, so this is her terminology. She's calling this the initial low, sustained low, and the high level. Now, we know that by the forecasting that, that we're seeing and, and other climate models that we're gonna expect lower water levels over the next decade. But just how low it gets, is it gonna be even exceeding this? 
So this was a meter drop. And you can see this is one of those wetlands that completely dried out when it fell um, below a certain water level. Okay, so we had wetland inventories that we had to develop ourselves for Georgian Bay because nobody else was going to do it. And we call this the McMaster Coastal Wetland Inventory, um, and it's the most comprehensive delineations of coastal wetlands for the entire eastern and northern Georgian Bay. And it's based on high resolution image uh, that, we, that we had acquired licenses for during that, that initial low period, because we thought that that was normal. So 2002 to 2008. But then when water levels went up again, um, some, of the, some of these uh, satellite, uh, uh, the satellites were no longer um, continuing. So we started having to use other means of getting images and so we started using drones. Now, as I said, we were very fortunate to have been funded to do research throughout all of these periods. So in the initial period, we were funded by government. And then once government um, funds ran out because they, you know, they give you five years of funding and well, that's enough, right? So then, but then the people that live there, they said, well, you're not gonna stop now, are you? because look, things are still changing. And so the foundations came in. So in the foundations, they live there, so they have a really big stake in it. So they continue to fund all of the work from 2009 onwards until even now. And during this time, uh, and I'm not gonna talk about all the things that we did, but um, I'm gonna focus mostly on the Macrovice survey, but just to let you know that one of the main reasons we're doing that is because we're very interested in what's happening to the fish communities, because the fish communities depend on the macrophyte communities. So this is Danny, and um, so we, and I, I just basically said to her, well, we need to know, we need to find a way to determine if there has been significant changes in the plant communities. So, she went away, like any good graduate student, came back about two years later, and said, okay, I found a way. So she's uh, using this basically non-parametric um, test to look at significant differences. And the one thing that came out very, very strongly in our data set is that for those lacustrine wetlands that are somewhat protected, so that they're not directly exposed to the, to the Great Lakes, are very different, behaving very differently than those that are fringe wetlands that are along the shores. Um, and then we conducted an indicator species analysis, and so that shows you importance values of species. And then all the plant taxa that had a significant, uh, that were significant, and I, I used a, a higher p-value just so that we would have a larger data set to work with. Um, but in fact, that only increased it by about three or four species. If we cut it off at uh, 0 0.05, uh, we would have still gotten quite a lot. But then I, th I, th I thought, rather than looking at 49 taxa, how about looking at them as functional groups? And so let's look at them from the perspective for water level disturbances in terms of where they are located in the, in the zonation. So whether they're in the emergent, submergent, or floating. Are, are they rooted or are they free floating, unrooted? Um, do, is their growth form sort of at the base or are they you know, at the canopy? Again, these would reflect different depths of water. And so these are the, the, the seven groups, um, but uh, seven groups for each, but eight in total, because there's one that's in one that's not in the other. Okay, so I'm gonna go through this, um, but before I, I, I just want to show you that visually, when on the ground, when we were sampling, it, no, I'm not just making this up, we actually saw real differences when you're on there. So this is what I'm calling the normal fluctuation. So five years, 
high now, five years low, you know, so everything is hunky-dory and we get higher diversity. And then we get into this period when this is the next sort of going into the sustained low period where we're starting to see no fluctuations and so now the emergent vegetation have basically taken over and then this rapid flooding, which is the third period where we get now deep emergence and a high diversity of canopy species. So now the submergent plants are having a party, right? They're just saying, come on in and the water's nice. Okay, so everything is gonna be uh, looking like this. So this is for the exposed. So we had 68 um, site years. Um, and these are just the relative abundances of the, of the um, species that were important, that had a high important value within these various functional groups. And so what you see here is that in the exposed, the, the bulrush and the heart stem, so all of these are what I'm calling the shoreline emergence, they are they were not present at all during the, in, the, in the middle period when it's very, very low water. And then the rest of that in the initial were all of these submergent species, okay, uh, the canopy submergent species. Now this might sound um, weird to you because you know, it's low water, but remember that submergent vegetation can migrate. So they just basically happily migrated down to the three or four meters where they would have been anyway. So we were able to sample those. Um, in this, and, and this we're still trying to understand, but the only species that had an important value that was significant during this period was the spike, the marsh spike rush, which is a, a, a it's an edge species. Um, and in fact, the marsh spike rush it doesn't really, you can't really find it um, unless the water levels are very, very far down because as you're walking along, they, they, they need some water, but they, they don't like to be completely inundated. So you have to actually see them and they're very, um, they're, they sometimes can get overshadowed by the other emergent species. In the, in the other ones, we have soft stem, we have floating buried, uh, bladderworts, these are the unrooted, floating, uh, submergent. Um, and then finally we have the floating, the water shield. And these are all in the... Now we get into the protected. In the protected, much more important in terms of the shoreline emergence. When we're talking about these shallow emergence, also a lot more important. And then the, the milfoil, so this is a very, very big part. Again, remember that we had the canopy species being very important in the exposed wetlands. There's definitely a lot more species that were important in the protected wetlands. And then finally, we start to see some of these lilies, and particularly the lilies and the, uh, the floating were much more prominent in the high water years. Okay, so I hope I've convinced you. These wetlands have not been disturbed by human activities. Most of the indices that we've developed and that are published in the literature are meant to look at human disturbances. And we're using them regardless of the water levels that we're, we're sampling in. So what does this tell me? This tells me that the data that we collected in the early years are reflecting water level disturbances that are very, very characteristic of that low water level period. And they're not like the ones when they were high, but yet, and we're gonna get different values for our ecological indices. But yet, it's not reflecting human disturbances. So we need to develop a new set of disturbance 
uh, water level disturbance indicators for these species that have not been used before. So that's, that's one. And that's, you know, that's a hard thing to admit to at the end of your career, that somebody else needs to come in and start the work all over again. Okay, so that's, that's, that's the end of one, uh, one big part of, uh, of what I want to talk about. The other part is that, um, and this is really probably more problematic for me uh, than anything else, is that this, this wetland, uh, the boundary of the lower, the lower part of the boundary being in the two meters depth, is so arbitrary. And we know that, for instance, the, the wetlands during the low water level period did very, very well. So as water levels dropped precipitously um, at one meter over maybe two years, the submerged vegetation was still right there. They, were, they didn't skip a beat. No. So, so obviously, in the Georgian Bay at any rate, because there's good light penetration, and as long as there's nothing, nothing there at the end, like a rock sill that, that prevents them from, from migrating out, they're, they're there. And so I am going to show you a series of photos, and, and there's a lot of information in here, but I wanted just you to focus on one thing, and that is where the submerged vegetation is located. So Green Island is in Severn Sound, and it's a privately owned island, so it hasn't been developed very much at all. And in fact, we use it as a reference site. Um, and the coastal marshes uh, there we studied because we look at muscalunge and uh, the young of the year muscalunge and they use this for habitat. And so I'm just keeping this here to, to let you know. So in the first uh, 14 years of uh, inundation, we have these photos. Now, it's, it's kind of hard to see, again, because the, there's probably a little bit too much light, but you can see this dark area here. That is all submergent vegetation. In fact, when we first got to Green Island, we thought, well, this whole, this whole thing is wetland, because we could literally walk, almost walk right across with waders. I just realized it's Maria. Were you in this wetland? Or that was probably not. OK, um, this is my senior moment, you know, when I. <laughs> and so now we're getting into the transition period here. Now water levels are going up. You can barely see that uh, dark. Once it starts to get high waters, there's just, and, and these photos um, just don't show it at all. But you might say, oh, well, there's nothing there anymore. Well, if you look at these early photos and you look at this one, you say, okay, well, you know, obviously there's not much submergent there. But in 2023, when water levels were still above the long-term mean, last fall, we went out and we did a drone shot. And it's very clear from this, from, from my vantage point anyway, I don't know if you can see it, but there's submerged vegetation all the way out to there. And that is not two meters deep. The aquatic portion of the wetlands is severely underestimated if you're just in waders and you're walking out, which is primarily the way that most of the researchers are doing their plant surveys. If you don't have a canoe like we do, and we go all the way out to where the plants stop growing, then you're not at the bottom of that wetland. And there is no lower boundary for the SAV in this case. It just keep on growing to the other side. And they ex extend well below the three meters. Uh, and so when we're sitting there, um, in, in the boat and we go out there and we see that there's actually submergent vegetation and then over here you can see the, the dead tree zone. And here's a close up of the dead tree zone. These dead trees have been there since 2015, all right? And water levels are supposed to go back down again so are the metal species going to return? They haven't returned yet. 
The literature will have us believe that within three or four years of inundation, the vegetation is going to come back. It's not coming back yet. Okay? It has been eight years since we started noticing these dead trees. So instead of looking at them as being disturbed, can we also now start thinking of them as being resilient? Those ones that can actually go back to the way it was, maybe a little changed, but still function the same way as before. Okay, so summary of the plant responses. It's very important that we start looking at exposed versus protected, which for the most part, most of the wetland researchers do. During the prolonged low water le levels, the unrooted and the canopy submergence were greatly reduced in importance because they're outcompeted by the unrooted submergence. And then after prolonged low water levels and then the return to high water levels, the canopy species start to dominate again. And that reduces the importance of the shoreline emergence and then the rooted floating, like the lilies, start to become important again. So, you know, aside from the fact that we use these for ecological indices to look at human disturbances and all that, and really that's, you know, that's really for the, the bean counters. You know, all the, the government wants to say, oh yeah, this is an excellent wetland, this is a poor wetland, whatever. What's important to me is what is actually happening to the plants and, and what is then happening to the fish that depend on these plants. And then the other thing is, you know, these, these dead trees, um, you know, they're there, they're dead. They're still there even after eight years. I don't know how much longer they will be there. Um, but things start to use it. So, for instance, we found that um, in a lot of the shrubby areas now, we're starting seeing turtles. The blanding turtles are actually using that. Now, whether they're using that uh, to, uh, we're, because we're doing much more work along the coast and we're seeing them, were they there before when, that was, when there was low water levels? I don't know, but maybe somebody needs to do that research. Um, there are other species that are also using that. Uh, there are certain fish that are getting filtered out. Um, and so one of the, one of the, in the back of my mind while doing all this plant work, you know, has always been, okay, you know, we're, you know, going to the, the main course now. So like submergents were like sort of the appetizers. So now going to the main course and looking at the fish community, well, what a drag it was because we couldn't sample the fish in the same way. And that's one of the sort of basic, you know, understanding about long-term monitoring programs is that you have to use the same, the same strategy, the same approach, the same protocol. Well, we set a wetland, uh, we set fike nets in the wetland. That's the primary way we do fish surveys. That you can do very well in the wetland, regardless of what the depth is. You can't do that when there's a big shrub and the dead tree in the middle. So while Danny was away you know, thinking about statistics to, to determine uh, differences in plants, she was actually busy doing something else. So I said, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could just put cameras down and then you can start recording them. So she went away and she designed this little structure. Um, and so we now have data with um, videos of fish swimming around, and so we are trying to now compare that with any of the fike net data that we have. But then, how do you process 100 hours of video footage really quickly so that you can defend and get out of your supervisor's hair? <laughs> well, that's where the internet comes in, right? Citizen science. So she started, she's, she contacted a whole bunch of other uh, platforms, but it turns out Zooniverse was the most uh, appropriate for us. And if those of you that know, don't know Zooniverse, um, it can, you can build custom tutorials and field guides. You can talk about your research. Um, and then you can also code 
if you know how to code, you can then have retirement rules for the, for the things that the people are, are helping to, to process. So we launched this, so it took about a year, well, maybe not quite a year, but it took about at least six months in conversation with Zooniverse and getting everything all together. And we launched it finally in January 24. And then, so a month later, okay, a little bit more than a month later, February 28th, we had recruited almost 1,400 volunteers. They completed 188,000 classifications of the videos. Of these are all videos that have retired. So they viewed, reviewed 140 hours. So we just had 100 hours that we were trying to figure out. And the, this is the clincher, right? 90% of the videos don't have any fish in it. So can you imagine poor Danny sitting there going, no fish, no fish, no fish. Anyway, they finished all six sites within the, of the comparison that we were trying to do within that month, and they were asking us for more. And then people from the schools were contacting me and saying, oh, we want to do this for the fall. You know, when are we going to get more? So I'm thinking, oh my god, you know, I, now I have to start taking videos of wetlands just to feed this beast that we just created. <laughs> but no, you know, all kidding aside, this is really great. And so I'm now building that into my next grant, right? Because Great, because here, there's my outreach and education right there. Okay, a couple other things um, as we're getting close to the end here now. Three more slides, I promise you. So Great Lakes Coastal Wetlands, so you can see here um, all of them. And the one thing that you need to know is that this is the bar for Lake Huron, which includes Georgian Bay. You can see that well over half of those are lacustrine, and those are in the ones that I'm talking about in Georgian Bay. But the problem is that in order to have them assessed properly and then enter into government databases, they have to be greater than two hectares. And only 15% of all the wetlands in Georgian Bay meet that criterion. And then, you know, for most of these, the two meters depth don't really apply as the, as the bottom depth. So if, you're, if you have people developing in areas that, you know, oh, that's two meters deep, and we've, we had that. We had a couple of situations where two meters deep, you know, they put a, a dock in there, um, you know, from, coming from another end. And, and you, you start to say, okay, we really need to establish different rules for the Georgian Bay Coastal Wetlands. The other thing is, I think it's more important now to start identifying the resilient wetlands from those that are vulnerable. And not just treat them as one, you know, universal data set. So well, uh, uh, Dan Weller, a, a PhD student, uh, and I developed this um, vulnerability index to indicate regions that are more that have more vulnerable wetlands to these disturbances and we can we can also calculate at a site level something called a resilience index and it turns out that these dead trees that I was talking to you about these dead trees are influenced by the VI the the vulnerability vulnerability index so we should be able to use these RI scores to screen for those wetlands that are vulnerable or, or resilient, um, and then map them for the governments. And this will help them understand you know, which ones need to be protected because they're gonna become climate refugia. So in the future, um, the, the, I promise my husband it's gonna be three more years. Um, the next two to three years, we're going to go back and resample, choosing some sites based on the RI scores. And then we're going to look at both the plants and the fish communities and determine how resilient they have been or not. And the current Georgia Bay conditions are very unique. And so I don't want to hear anybody tell me 
that we should, you know, this research has already been done. We can just, you know, take it from Lake Ontario or Lake Erie. They won't work. And we don't have historical information that can inform us because, as I showed you, nobody could have predicted these dead trees without actually seeing them. So, I'm posing this question to you rhetorically. Do you think it's Jeme or deja vu? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have some time for questions. Anyone who wants to kick off? Please, Nancy. Hi, that was a really great talk. Thanks so much. Um, I'm thinking about some of the policy implications. I'm wondering if, one, you think that we should be trying to control Great, Great Lakes water levels for Huron and Georgian Bay like we do some of the other lakes. And the second question is, um, I'm trying to figure out, so you're saying the two meter depth is not a great way of defining wetlands, is a better way, say, the extent of submergent vegetation because maybe you know maybe we haven't been able to do that in the past because we haven't had technology but with drones and satellites maybe something like that might be more accessible to policymakers now so i think you answered your own questions there um <laughs> no i absolutely I, I mean i i've been trying to you know when you have the technology and the time and the interest you can definitely look for for each site, right, the specifics of each site, and say, yeah, that's that would be ideal. Um, don't forget, cottagers live around there. They have a lot of time. <laughs> they love canoeing. They love boating. So maybe this is something they can do as well. Um, so in terms of policy, OK, I, I'm not a big fan of regulation of anything. I mean, I don't think we've done a great job regulating water levels for Lake Ontario and Lake Superior. So I wouldn't want us to regulate the Lake Huron and, and Michigan. But there is something to be said about those extremes and controlling for them if they are not natural, okay? So by that I mean if erosion has occurred in the St. Clair River that has then led to more water being, you know, coursing through the river and therefore uh, reducing, then I think we need to, to address that. We need to put sediment back into, into, the, into the channels. Um, should we do anything to, you know, I just don't think that we know enough to say, oh yeah, this is too low or this is too high. Um, and also, is it instantaneous? You know, how quickly can you actually adjust to that? So I, I don't think that that is the, the, I don't think that's the right approach. But also in the long run, extremes are going to be the norm. And I think we just need to be much more cognizant that whatever rules that we created, you know, in, in the last century, just needs to be updated um, on a s almost lake by lake basis, and not one fits not one size fits all. Uh, yeah, that's it for. That's, <laughs> anyone else? You've had some time to think about it. Maybe a silly question from my side. I'm not a biologist or a natural scientist. I was just wondering about the correlation between weather patterns over all these years and the lake levels. I, I, I didn't really see oh, that. Oh, yes. Your... So the, the water levels are the, the sum effects of the evaporation and precipitation, right? So, it's the, it's, it's, so in, in the lower water levels primarily was driven by really rapid or not rapid, but high evaporation rates because it, there was no ice cover um, in the lakes in, in some of those years. And so you get, you get uh, um, a lot of those sort of things. Um, the, no, so when, when, superior, when Lake Superior holds water back, then we get lower in, in Huron. And then conversely, when they open up their gates for whatever reasons, then we get higher. So there needs to be some more fair um, adjudication of like how that is done, for sure. 
But uh, in terms of, yeah, the, the, it's mostly evaporation and precipitation, and those were the patterns. Okay, there's a question there. Just, Just a give me. quick question. Uh, the trees that are dead, uh, presumably in relatively recent arrivals closer to the water, and so they should all be quite young. Is any tree ring, can you count tree rings to confirm that there are any young trees? No, but it sounds like it's something you might want to do. Um, I don't. I don't know. I don't know enough about it. I, I know that the trees, yes. So the trees are predominantly um, out in the towards the the tree. You know where the forests are, um, and what you get up in the in the towards the water is more shrubs, which I don't know if you, I mean I don't know enough about it. But I don't know if you can age shrubs, other than by the height of of those. Thank you. Anyone else? If this one where? Oh, uh, over okay. there. Hi, my name is Indrani. Uh, I enjoyed your talk. Uh, my background isn't really in biology or like ecology or any of that related fields. So my question is, why did you decide to analyze fish species instead of something like reptiles, like snakes? <laughs> Uh, wow, okay. We do, we, do, we do look at reptiles as well, but there aren't as many reptiles that out in the water as there are. So we do work with uh, freshwater turtles, or we do research on freshwater turtles. But the main reason for fish is really, fish is something that a lot of people identify with. Um, also, the nursery habitat, which predominantly wetlands are, the, a lot of the fish there, eventually get eaten by the larger fish, which is what most people want, right? The, the large fish that they, they, they catch. And so in order to originally, I mean, um, if truth is that I turned wetlands into fish habitat and got a lot of funds. And you never looked back because it was just miserable just trying to get wetland work funded. But then when I turned it into fish habitat, all kinds of sources I could apply to. So that's really why I'm a lot of interest in fish. Thank you. I think there was one more question here. Someone raised his hand. No. OK, let's give Pat uh, another round of applause. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.